The McClellan saddle is the best in the world after the Mexican and Texas saddles. And if used correctly, there will be no sore backs with this saddle. All in all, it is the best military saddle yet in use. This week on the 11th OVC, the best fitting saddle in the world. Okay, the third best next to the Mexican and the Texan. But how did the McClellan saddle generally fit horses? How common were sore backed horses with the McClellan saddle? And what was the general opinion of troopers who rode the staple of American military history? Welcome to this multi-part series exploring the McClellan saddle. There's a lot of rumors about it, and I want to talk about some of the nuances of this famous American military saddle. It's high points, low points, and general opinion in the ranks. But as you can guess, what was done in the field was far from what was required in the manuals. Thus, I strongly recommend reading Lessons of a Decade, written by a volunteer cavalryman. This book is a great complement to Cogden's Cavalry Compendium. In a previous video, I mentioned that Cogden's Compendium is a must read, if not the only read, if you were just to read one book. So if Cogden's is my number one book you should read, I would have to say my number two book, that's what I would say the most important read, even before diving into period manuals, is this book, Lessons of a Decade. It gives a great breakdown of all the lessons learned in the war with plenty of time to think about it as it was written more than a decade after the commencement of the war. If you need access to a copy of either of these books, please visit 11thovc.com, click on the Cavalry Library, and you will see them there. So the first thing that we're actually going to look at is the general fit of the McClellan saddle and how it fits in with what we know with equine ergonomics today. The author of this book, Lessons of a Decade, opens up by saying the following. With the McClellan saddle, there is very little excuse for sore backs. This saddle, if the requisite care is taken in its use, is one of the best in the world after the Mexican and the Texan. If the blankets are kept smooth and the load on the saddle carefully adjusted so as to not chafe, there will be no sore backs with this saddle. Should one commence, however, there is nothing in the world to cure it like plenty of warm water and Castile soap. So as you can see with this initial analysis, the author states that the saddle is one of the best designs in equine history and goes on to imply that the only reason you develop a sore back with the McClellan saddle is out of the fault of the rider by having a bunched up saddle blanket, a strap under the saddle, or just general negligence from the trooper. So let's take a look at an original tree, compare it to modern reproductions, and see what we discover. Now, honestly, this is the first time that I've done this, so I don't even know what the results will be with these multiple saddles until we're done here today. First, however, in order to understand if a tree properly fits, we must first go through the basics of saddle tree fit as we understand it in greater equine healthcare professions today. If you haven't already, check out any number of great videos on saddle fit and equine ergonomics and you'll learn a great deal if you haven't already checked out what makes a saddle properly fit. Uh, in my ignorance, I used to think that uh, you know if, if, if everything looked smooth and, and perpendicular, or sorry, uh, parallel to the uh, back of the horse that it was good. Uh, and this isn't necessarily true. In fact, in, the, in a large case, this isn't true. I personally started down the road of studying the McClellan saddle as it, as it is designed to fit on the back of a horse uh, due to, number one, a couple rumors, not a couple, but a lot of rumors in the, in the reenacting community that discuss how a McClellan saddle really doesn't fit horses, they, they aren't, they're really bad for the backs of the horses. Uh, and of course, as I read and look at period manuals, and of course, in this Lessons of, De Lessons of a Decade book, it is clear that the McClellan saddle actually was a good fitting saddle. So then what that made me do is dive in to what makes a saddle actually properly fit a horse. So what I learned is that basic saddle or tree fit can be summed up in just a few basic steps, actually seven. Number one, the balance. Number two, the clearance of the saddle. Number three, the cantle width. Number four, the girth placement. The fifth rule will be the saddle length. Number six is the tree angle. And the last one, number seven, is the tree width. So first, let's talk about balance. Simply put, if the saddle rocks back and forth on the horse's back, not only will it spit your blanket out the rear of the saddle, it is an overt sign that the saddle is putting all of your weight on two small pressure points in the center or the middle of the horse's back. As you can see here with this saddle, there actually is a little bit of rock, not a lot, but enough of a rock that you can tell there definitely is some major pressure points in this horse. Now, the second thing we need to look at 
is a clearance between the withers and the pommel. Those who are new riders or starting some pony club, the standard textbook answer is two or three fingers between it. So you have three fingers or two fingers that should go clearance around the, the withers of the horse and clearance in the, in the pommel. Now, if you can see here, I only have about two fingers right in between, definitely not three. Now on the top of the withers, I can only get one finger in there. What this does, this does not allow the horse freedom of motion on his neck or withers or possibly even the shoulder, but we'll get to that here in a little bit, to actually be able to do what he needs to do. Now, another thing that's important to know about item number two, which is that clearance around the withers, is you definitely want to keep some of that clearance, not all two or three finger widths, but some of that clearance going down to the bars. The bars should actually kind of not flare out a little bit, but there should be a little bit of a gap there to allow the shoulder to come back. Now, in equine ergonomics, what you notice is that the shoulder is right here, and when it when it actually goes, when the horse is, you know, especially trotting or running, that horse actually, the shoulder goes back into the bars of that saddle and if you don't have if you have a saddle that is really that is really tied up against the skin that shoulder actually uh, clips the edge of that saddle and does not allow that shoulder to freely move now as you can actually see in this saddle the front of the bars actually are already kind of uh, up uh, flush up against the shoulder here which then does not allow especially when i put weight on it my weight on it does not allow for that shoulder to go back in fact it actually clips uh, the front of this saddle Simply put, the wither clearance needs to be long enough, deep enough, and high enough. So now the third thing that we need to look at is the width of the saddle or the channel uh, between the pommel and the cannel. As a general rule of thumb found in veterinary journals or equine anatomy books, there should be about four fingers width between the bars of the saddle. Or another way of looking and seeing if that opening is wide enough is the actual to identify the tendon transfer point on the spine of the horse itself. So what you're looking for on the tendon transfer point is you actually have from the spine out, you have these tendons coming up and attaching to the spine right about here where you see that kind of soft area right there. So as you go down, there shouldn't be any bars, any pressure at all from the spine out around this tendon transfer point. You can start having your bars right about here, uh, but nothing from the spine out, which on both sides is about four fingers width. So along with the bars of the saddle not coming up too close to the spine, you also can't have the bars of the saddle further out. Cause then there's, I mean, there's only a so much uh, room that you have before the barrel of the horse starts going back down and sloping away from the saddle. And so if your bars are too far out, then that only limits, I mean, that, uh, not only, but it, it limits the amount of surface area that, that the bars of that saddle touches the horse. Thus, again more weight on on a lower surface area thus causing more pain on the horse so now fourth let's talk about girth placement this is one of the areas that is actually pretty difficult for the mcclellan saddle or not say difficult but different because the mcclellan saddle is actually what we call today a center fire rig meaning that if you take a look at where the actual uh, cinch or the girth is it's actually central or for the most part central to the actual bars of the saddle uh, versus a western saddle that is more up front or even in english Ideally, the girth needs to be perpendicular to the saddle. Do not move the girth forward to where you think it needs to be, like a lot of people do up, up forward, because then it pulls the saddle too far forward and limits the motion of the shoulder. If this happens, the shoulder can actually have cartilage damage catching on the bars of the saddle after every step, which causes significant chronic issues. So now the fifth thing we need to look at is the saddle length. If it's too long, it puts pressure on the kidneys uh, on most horses, or especially if you have a mare in, in season, then that puts pressure on the ovaries. And of course, you definitely don't want to put pressure on the ovaries on a mare when she's in season. Trust me about that. So what we're looking for specifically on the length of the, of the horse is basically the, the no-go or the go zones of the actual saddle bars. Uh, what you're looking for on the rear end here uh, is you want to look at where the, the last rib is and go straight up from there, okay? Or where the hair comes together, go straight up from there, which generally is right around on this horse right around here, this is a really short-backed horse right here, okay? So you have that going on. Then as far as the, the forward uh, length that you're looking for is, is more on the actual shoulder here. So if you actually take a look, this is the shoulder, um, and this is where the saddle definitely does not need to be. But also, as we talked about before, there needs to be some room that when you actually pick up the horse's hoof, okay, or that when that horse, when that horse actually moves, and you can see that saddle, go back and forth 
it actually goes to a little bit a little bit past here which is why that bar needs to kind of give enough for that two two finger width beyond there so basically what you're looking at is if of course if you include the no-go zone or the triangle of the withers okay what you're looking for is exactly the length of the saddle cannot be beyond here can't go above the shoulders and on this short back horse there's not a whole lot of room for that saddle to sit and if you include the tendon transfer points of the horse, again, from the spine out to where that soft tissue is, that tendons you don't want to put pressure on, uh, you're looking at basically, you know, an area off the spine down, right around there. Of course, the shoulder blade, you include that. And of course, where the barrel of the horse starts going off pretty steep, again, you pretty much end right here. And of course, with the length being right here, this whole area right here, is the area where you need the bars of the horse to sit. There's especially on, on or especially on this short backed horse, there's not a lot of room for error. Again, the length of that saddle or the bars of the saddle can't go too far back to where it puts pressure on the kidneys uh, or the kidneys of a horse or the ovaries of a mare, especially when in season. So the next thing we want to take a look at is actually the angle of the saddle tree itself. So again, what you're looking for is the angle of that saddle to be the same as the angle of the shoulder. So if you take a look, the shoulder comes in like this. And then when I meet the saddle, you can tell the saddle's actually flared out a little bit more for a wider horse as far as the angle. And now the width of the saddle actually is pretty good, has that four finger width on the spine. Uh, but if you actually take a look at the shoulder, okay, as it comes across, when I meet the saddle, the saddle's actually canned out a little bit more, which means it puts more pressure on top of the spine than on the bottom. And lastly, point number seven we have to talk about is the width of the tree itself. And really what that means is, is the tree wide enough to allow that shoulder to come in and not clip on the edge of this uh, bar every single time he walks. Because if he does, if that shoulder clips on that bar every single time, then you're going to cause significant tissue damage or cartilage damage. And of course, making a chronic injury or chronic wound for that horse. So specifically on this saddle, what that means is that the shoulder needs room to go underneath. Now, if you take a look at the front of this bar, it's actually pressed up against the skin for the most part and when he takes his shoulder and goes back it'll actually clip and so there's actually not a whole lot of room around here this actually needs to be flared out or widened a little bit more uh, to be properly fitted so let's take all those seven points and put them into one just overall point. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to put some saddles on to see if they fit. Uh, and again, the, the classic example of McClellan saddles not fitting well, we'll see if that's true or not. So basically what we're looking for first is we got to identify that shoulder, okay? And that shoulder is right here, that big, big protrusion. You can kind of see that. It rotates right there. So again, we don't want the, sh the uh, saddle to be over that shoulder right there. So there's one no-go zone, okay, beyond that shoulder. The other no-go on is of course right on top of the withers you don't want to be right on top of the withers and so this triangular point right here is again a no-go zone then we look at the back or the length of the saddle itself again what we do is we come up from the last rib straight up and again, this is the no-go zone. Anything beyond this, further back, puts pressure on the kidneys, and again, pressure on the ovaries if you have a mare. So then we took at the, the, the tendon transfer point. From the spine out, you have just that little ridge that comes down, and those tendons come up and secure the muscle of the horse to the actual, uh, to the spine itself. And so again, you don't want any pressure directly on top of the spine right there. So again, right on top here is a no-go zone. Then, right here, beyond, is good but the barrel of the horse comes down and basically starting about right here becomes too steep for any bar of a saddle to really do any good so the go zone where you want your saddle to be is right around here again not a whole lot of uh, room if you will for the horse uh, but this is kind of what we're looking for on the bars in fact I might be a little too far back on my on my uh, back here probably more more along the lines right here okay uh, so again we're looking for the bars to be right about there and of course the cinch or the girth to be you know centered with the the tree of the saddle so let's go ahead and see through we're going to try different three different saddles and see which fits better so here we have a standard mainstream uh, Civil War reenacting saddle that you get from uh, most of the mainstream uh, vendors out there. I say most, there's basically only two right now. Um, but if you take a look, okay, if we you know, where the saddle actually sits, uh, again, what we want to make sure is, is that, number one, is there a balance? If you take a look, again, there's some rock. So this is not really a well-balanced saddle when it comes to the, how, the, how the saddle sits on the horse itself. Uh, then beyond that, you you could take a look is it in the no-go zone well 
And as far as the two to three fingers above the, uh, the withers of the horse, we barely can stick two in there. In fact, my two is pretty tight. It's actually pretty much one right now. So that's not looking good. Now, as far as the length of the saddle, you know, going from the shoulders to the back, it actually has, has a decent length. It's not too long. It uh, doesn't put undue pressure on necessarily the back of the horse. Uh, there's, I mean, it is, especially since this is a short-backed horse, uh, you know, he, he is kind of toward the end of what's acceptable, um, but you know, he's, he should be all right. Now, if we take a look at the actual uh, flare, the angle, the angle as there is, kind of looks like there's enough room for that shoulder to come up underneath. Not as much as there should be, but there is definitely a, you know, a decent amount that that should be in there. Now, the other thing we have to look at again is the girth. If you take a look at the saddle, okay, kind of where it needs to be, and take a look at the girth in the center fire rig, it actually, you know, it, it'll work definitely, um, but you definitely have to watch. Some of these go pretty far back. So again, you want to be right there. Again, don't put it right underneath the, the elbow of the horse, because if you do this, that pushes the saddle forward, up underneath the shoulders, uh, and doesn't allow the horse to actually move, jump, or maneuver how he needs to. Now, this is the second saddle we put on. This is actually what you uh, would order as a quarter horse tree, uh, as a living historian or reenactor. And uh, if you look at these trees, now this is, now it's actually on a quarter horse, to give you an idea, this is uh, definitely a quarter horse. Uh, so we'll see how the quarter horse tree fits on an actual quarter horse. Uh, if you take a look, it's gonna sit back where it needs to. If you take a look, uh, it's actually lengthwise, okay? Again, it, it's actually not too bad lengthwise. Uh, I probably have a little bit too far forward, but uh, if you take a look right here, here, the actual bars of the front of the saddle tend to actually dig in. There's not a whole lot of room up underneath the uh, the shoulder right here, and you need more room to, to clear that. Okay. Uh, as far as room up under the uh, the pommel of the saddle, there's definitely that two to three fingers width, as you can see right there. So that's good. You're not going to get wear and tear on the uh, the withers, the spine, or anything like that. Again, looking down the width, there's definitely that four finger. Actually, this is a five finger width on the spine to make sure there's no pressure on that tendon transfer point right there. Now, as far as looking at the back, okay, can you see down the, uh, the middle of the saddle there? Of course, it kind of moved on me. Um, there we go, as I get kicked. Um, and you'll see that you can you can look down the spine and there's no uh, no touching and there's some pretty good width width right there. Uh, looking at the back of the bars again, there's not. Uh, of course, he's standing kind of weird, but actually, when he does stand square, uh, there is some pretty good distribution on the actual bars of the saddle. So okay, now going up to the near side pommel, you'll see that you'll actually have uh, you know the the clearance on the shoulders there. Taking a look here. There's, you know, there's, it's all right. It's not great, but it's, uh, it, it'll definitely work uh, as far as riding uh, for, you know, not, not super, super long campaigns. The next thing we're going to talk about with this quarter horse saddle is the uh, the location of the actual girth. Okay, if you take a look again, it can't go forward, can't have an angle like that. It's got to be perpendicular to the tree itself. And when you do that, you actually can tell it's not too bad. Okay, it's not too bad for the tr for the uh, for the horse. It's not way back here. Uh, it's about where it needs to be. So as far as this uh, quarter horse tree, I'd say out of the first one or this one, this one fits just a tad bit better. All right, so this is the actual last saddle. Saddle. We'll look at uh, from what I can from what the uh, owner the previous owner told me this actually is an original tree Rebuilt uh, as a reenacting saddle or living historian saddle, but it was an original tree Of course, I don't have any providence on that, but uh, that's what he said So I believe him we'll, we'll go from there based on that then if you take a look the actual length of the saddle is pretty good It uh, doesn't go near his kidneys Okay, and it goes up to his withers and stops around his shoulder But if you take a look at the clearance, okay, it actually looks like we have pretty Pretty decent, decent clearance. Definitely got that two to three finger uh, height around there. Again, looking at the width, okay, you can see that it's not as wide as a quarter horse tree, but as far as where the pressure points are going, it definitely doesn't put any pressure on the transverse tendons of the spine itself. Okay, then after that, let's take a look at the actual bars or the, the front of the pommel here as it digs into the, uh, the shoulder blade. Now this is where uh, you want the difference between a quarter horse tree and a, uh, an original tree or, or a narrow tree. Uh, of course he moved, but uh, back when he stands square, 
um, actually kind of right there. As you stand square, you can see that actually looks right there. The angle actually of the saddle is pretty good, but the actual opening of that shoulder to come in underneath that bar, the front of that bar is actually not really open, does not allow that shoulder to go up underneath that bar. And it'll clip the cartilage of that shoulder right there, making it difficult for that horse to move. So in going over all the saddle fit theory and ergonomics of saddle fit and how, how it works with the horse, one of the things I want to do is actually apply it to the real world both today and then. The first question I always had was how common were saddle sores back then? And of course, in reading the uh, book that we mentioned, The Lessons of a Decade, saddle sores were definitely common. Now, the author definitely blames it on the trooper, the negligence of the rider, uh, having uh, you know wrinkles in the saddle blanket or, or straps underneath or just uh, improperly loading the saddle. Uh, but obviously he, he mentions actually later on in the book he also mentions that and scratches not scratches as in like a br branch scratch but scratches as far as a, a foot issue with horses were the two most common problems that the cavalry faced in the american civil war the next question I have though is, is, you know, what evidence do we have of saddle sores actually happening? I, I try to go back through some uh, mounted photos, uh, all the, the photos that I'm aware of. And the one photo that actually stood out the most as far as at least uh, saddle damage or some stress marks of saddle wear uh, was on the famous survivor, the only quote unquote survivor uh, of the Battle of Little Bighorn, which is the horse that you see here. Now, if you take a look, we'll zoom in. This horse actually has some stress marks and some, uh, if you want to call it damage, or where, uh, where the saddle fit, especially on his withers there. And combining that with my own anecdotal experience, I can definitely say that I've experienced, or we have experienced, a fair amount of our own saddle sores. Uh, for instance, the, the, the large 150 mile ride that we did a few years back uh, was probably the, you know, the, the instigator. And then beyond that, the, the you know, 30, 50, 80 other, you know, hundreds other mile rides that we've done, uh, that we've actually seen and experienced some saddle sores of our own. Now, most of them actually have not been along the spine, along the back. In fact, for us, the every single uh, saddle sore that we've actually had has been on the actual withers of the horse. And at first, we didn't really know where it was coming from, uh, but upon further investigation, I'll put one of these saddles on here. Upon further investigation, what we realized is the, the width of the saddle tree was not wide enough uh, and the angle was not what it should be. And what happened is when the, uh, when the saddle was mounted, it was you know, torqued to the near side or the, you know, the left side of the horse. Uh, and then the top, of the, the, the top of the bars actually dug into the withers of the horse. They sat in on it, uh, digging into it. Now, more specifically, what we actually had to deal with is, now this, we got rid of the saddle that actually caused it, uh, but what was happening is the top of the bar right here was digging into the, to the actual, the top of the withers right here, uh, and actually, uh, you know, caused some pretty good saddle sores. Um, I mean, they actually op open sores. Uh, and of course, here you can see this saddle uh, arguably doesn't, doesn't fit really good either, but uh, definitely wouldn't have that issue, uh, you know, because there's definitely room in here. Now, so in closing our part number one of the McClellan saddle series, uh, I think it's important to note or, or kind of conclude with uh, the fact that the, the McClellan saddle definitely fit the horses. It fit a, a lot. I mean, it fit the horses then and arguably it fits a lot of the horses today as well. Uh, what I've seen from the uh, from the reproduction saddles today versus the originals that I've seen, uh, you know, they're, the originals actually arguably fit a lot of the saddle, a lot of the horses today. Uh, but definitely if you have have, when it comes to that quarter horse tree, that definitely a shoulder coming into it, the width of the tree definitely matters. Uh, and that's where we get the quarter horse trees, of course. But uh, all in all, you know, from a historical perspective, uh, the McClellan saddle, uh, arguably, according to this author, was one of the best saddles out there. So much so that the American military continued to have versions of the McClellan all the way up to the 20th century. Thank you again for watching this first episode of the McClellan Saddle Series. We hope you watch the second episode. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please like us on Facebook. And until we see you in the field again, ride hard.